All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk, uh, Designing a UI System from Scratch. So first of all, who am I? Uh, I'm the co-founder of the Swiss studio Asteroid Lab and a programmer in the studio. Uh, and I'm also a game programming teacher at SAE Institute, Geneva. Uh, the first game of our studio um, is called Terraformers. And here you can see uh, Mr. MV, a uh, French streamer, playing it. Um, one of the highlights of the, of, the, of the life of that uh, game for us. Um, Terraformers, uh, it's a game we've been developing for three years. It's, uh, it's a strategic um, colony building game uh, where you bring life on Mars. And uh, it has roguelike elements. So you can see he was picking uh, one card out of three at the start of the turn. And uh, now he ha has a, a hand of card that, that he can play. It's a it's a game that is it was made in uh, Unity, uh, and it's pretty UI heavy. Like uh, here in the video, you see only a fraction, but there are also screens that open. Here you can see an event, um, and uh, of course, all that UI had to be um, coded. Like the it has to update at the right time. It has to display always uh, up to date information, and so uh, I will explain a bit uh, how we did that. Uh, or approach to, to this kind of uh, issues or uh, challenge of uh, code organization. And uh, after that, I'll talk about uh, making a UI system from scratch, not in uh, Unity necessarily, but in, um, in uh, any uh, context, like your own engine or uh, on top of some middleware. And I'll explain why I, uh, I want to talk about that as well. So, Another project of mine is a uh, is a game dev, um, not a game dev, uh, uh, a game engine, and um, I've been working on it for uh, let's say two and a half years, uh, about as long as the as Terraformers, uh, which is made in Unity because I didn't have the engine uh, back then, um, and this is a game we made for uh, with uh, with friends for the for the Ludum there, the last Ludum there. And it's a very simple, like technically it's pretty simple. Uh, it's a 2D game with sprites, basically. Um, and uh, the gameplay is that you, you place uh, the little buildings that you get uh, in your hands on the left. And if you manage to put a house next to a terrace, for example, like uh, right here, you get points. Uh, so it's adjacent C based and it's pretty chill. The sound is pretty good. No sound uh, in the slides, but... Uh, um yeah, I'm very uh, happy ho at uh, how it turned out. I think it's, uh, yeah, I didn't expect uh, at first that it would turn out uh, so good. We got good reviews. So yeah, pretty proud of it. And on the technical side, so it's it was written enti enti entirely in C with, uh, with that engine I'm, I'm talking about. It's a cross-platform. It runs on the web uh, natively, on mobile on the web as well on uh, Android, because I wanted to port it to a small uh, handheld console that can run uh, Androids, and, uh, and PC, Mac, uh, etc. It has minimal dependencies, uh, so I try to use uh, small, lightweight libraries like uh, the STB libraries, for those that uh, know about it, so uh, STB image, uh, and some similar libraries for platform abstraction, uh, circle, um, is the uh, one that I want to, to mention, Circle so App and Circle so GFX. It's a, a, a thin layer ab above uh, OpenGL, uh, DirectX, um, uh, WebGL, uh, stuff like that. A metal, of course, for, for Mac and uh, iOS. Um, and the game engine uh, also contains a custom UI system uh, that, that I'm it's a work in progress. No, nothing in this game is uh, using it, but uh, but that's what that's the reason why I talk about my engine is uh, because I want to talk about the, the UI side of it. And just the, the general philosophy of um, development in this engine is a bit, uh, let's say, uh, old style, um, inspired by uh, many things. But one of the, the inspiration is uh, the engine called Our Machinery which was uh, unfortunately uh, discontinued for uh, probably leg legal reasons. It's a bit of a mystery. 
but it was a team that was making an engine uh, also purely in C and that was making very interesting technical blog post about it. So I encourage you to, to look for an archive of their blog. It's, uh, if you're interested, interested in uh, uh, game engine development and low level uh, programming, it's a, it's a great uh, resource. Uh, also, inspired a little bit by the, the programming videos of uh, Jonathan Blow, who has some pretty good uh, engineering slash progr programming opinion, in my, uh, in my, uh, in my opinion. And uh, Gacy Muratori as well, uh, uh, known for uh, the series uh, Handmade Hero, <coughs> series of video where he develops a, a game from scratch. So I just wanted to, to, to give you those uh, references so you can uh, also check them out if this kind of stuff interests you. Um, now, a small demo of the engine. So uh, I should trigger the video. Let's go. So the code is not important here, so it was random. So this is a small game I'm making uh, on the side uh, with uh, my girlfriend. She does the visuals and I do, do the programming. And here you can see, um, first we were in game mode and then we can switch in uh, edit, edit mode. It's a package with the game and made for that specific game. And here you can select the different entities, move them. Uh, you can yeah, flip them, change the dialogue that they have uh, in game. You can uh, save and load the, the game. So here are loads, so it resets the position to where they were before. You can make, uh, if I make a change and then I hit uh, undo or control Z, it, uh, it, uh, it works. Like it's a fully featured, just showing that it, it has all the functionalities that you would expect from, um, from a game engine, uh, or not from a game engine, but a, a basic editor, let's say. Uh, even, this is work in progress, but it was a kind of a profiler. Um, again, a work in progress, but uh, an asset window where you can evaluate, uh, inspect different assets. Here we have an animation uh, with the different frames. If I double click on the frame, it shows the sprites. I can scroll, zoom. All this UI is custom, so it's also why I show you this, is uh, so I can show you how to basically program these kind of UIs. Uh, here it's a sprite in a sprite sheet uh, that you can also visualize. Uh, importing assets, blah, blah. And then, yeah, the drop down menus also. Um, uh, some stuff, something that you can uh, implement uh, with uh, what I will show you uh, just after. Uh, so that's, that's for the engine. Short demo. Uh, UI programming is hard, so I don't know if you would agree with that statement, but uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of programmers find uh, UI programming hard, myself included. Like for Terraformers, it was the big part of the programming, like the, the UI and the transition, making it uh, yeah, feel good and just display the correct stuff and also performance in uh, Unity. It's not always that easy, unfortunately. Um, but I think it doesn't have to be uh, the hard part of making a game, the UI, um, at least from a programming perspective, if we make better tools or if we, we adopt some, some different ways of uh, thinking about it, which I will try to, to pitch a little bit to you. Um, here is a tweet from Oscar Stolberg that uh, made, um, uh, shit, I have a blank, the, uh, somebody help me, the, the game with uh, the, what? He made Bad North, yes. Townscaper, that's the one I was thinking, but he, he made ba Bad uh, North as well. And um, even him, uh, with uh, his experience uh, with uh, Unity, he's uh, asking, um, like, what's a good way to structure all the UI and the system, scene, the system scenes and have them talk to each other? So something that uh, also um, um, uh, Nicola, Nicola, talked about uh, in his talk, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, in his talk, um, and that was pretty present uh, in different uh, presentation uh, today as well. Um, yeah, can you can you run different like scenes or different systems separately, test them, uh, have a different setup for uh, each of them, and the answers to this tweet uh, were pretty interesting, I thought. Uh, so. Um, Directly, I saw like uh, the the reactive programming and dependency injection uh, solution, 
So I generally use union weeks to expose properties are observable or se observables that can be listened to whenever the change value. Um, I'm not going to read everything, but I agree with uh, Oscar in this case. It sounds complex. It sounds complicated, and I'm uh, allergic to complexity. Like I try to uh, limit the complexity to a, a maximum extent that I can. And so this kind of uh, solutions. So if you're not familiar, reactive programming is um, do something when a value change. So a value change, maybe I update the score because the score changed in the game state. And there are concepts with queues. Um, I'm not so familiar because I didn't uh, explore that uh, very much. Uh, but uh, this is dependency injection. This is uh, setting up your systems, uh, connecting them by code uh, at initialization time. And it sounds, to me, it's, it makes me feel a bit an anxious. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like it. I don't like that complexity. And I'd like to push back a little bit on uh, those uh, ideas. I did try uh, these kind of things uh, long, a long time ago, maybe uh, five or six years ago, when I was still really into uh, object-oriented programming, which I'm not anymore. Um, now I tend to I tend towards simpler solution. I will talk about that uh, very soon. Uh, some other people uh, talked about various ECS frameworks, so maybe the one integrated in Unity or Entitas, uh, whatever uh, that is. And to me, it seems also overkill. Like uh, the question was not how do I make um, like emergent uh, behavior possible or how do I structure my game for performance with a ton of entities and stuff. The question was, how do I make a modular uh, system in uh, Unity or not? Uh, how do I basically synchronize the UI and the uh, gameplay states in different contexts? <coughs> uh, there is a solution of linking everything in the editor. So using scriptable objects, uh, bridge all the things like that you would normally do in code in the editor, drag and drop the objects, um, scriptable objects and such. To me, it's also, it doesn't feel that uh, safe to me um, because, so this one is more tricky to, for me to, to explain. I didn't uh, fully, um, I'm not fully sure yet what is bothering me so much, but uh, one part is I don't feel good about moving the, the business logic, the, the, the gameplay logic uh, to outside of code, like push as many of it uh, as possible outside of, of code. Why? Because um, then it becomes harder to uh, to change and to, to debug, in my opinion. Uh, for example, if you want to know where a variable is uh, touched, changed, um, you can do that very easily in uh, IDE. You just uh, click like uh, show all references or, st or stuff like that, or do a control uh, shift F and do a project-wide search. Uh, if you start using uh, references, uh, scenes, um, uh, scriptable objects, it gets trickier because you don't have those tools by default. So like you, you would have to program them, I guess. Um, and also, like it exposes all that logic to the, the game designers and artists. And <laughs> I prefer to take an approach where they can modify input data uh, like the, the stats of the different elements, the maybe the, the type of monsters that can go in the game, etc. But limit their, um, their ability to do damage to, the <laughs> to introduce bugs in the actual logic of the, the game. But maybe that's my bias also. Like maybe uh, I don't work with teams with uh, lots of designers, so I don't have to cater for them uh, that much. I mostly implement stuff in codes. So yeah, that was just my thoughts on that. What do I propose instead? What, what is my solution, my, uh, my, uh, my magic solution to that? Uh, make states centrally accessible. That's, that's m I'm convinced that making the state of the game be the center of the center, like the, the, the plaque tournante, the, the, the hub of, uh, of all the systems that act on the, the state. 
is the solution. Um, the UI will read the game state and update itself, and the gameplay code will change the game state depending on the circumstances. Um, and if you think about it, those solutions, oh, uh, let me come back to that uh, later. Uh, I will just do the, the other points. The, the, yeah, the gameplay code updates the game state, the UI constantly updates itself to match the game state, so it has to track it. Um, and I'll talk about that more as well. And there are no events, no callbacks, no complicated patterns like dependency injection uh, are required. Uh, it simplifies uh, everything quite a lot, I think. And that's how I would do it and how we did it in Terraformers. Um, we have a game state struct, which is kind of the root state of the game. And here it's an example with just a score. Okay, an int score um, probably needs to be public. It's pseudocode, I, I see I forgot the public here, if it's uh, C-sharp. Um, and then I have a static uh, game class with a public static game state, a variable called state, uh, which means that I can access the state everywhere in the game by doing game.state.score dot to string in this case to update the text display. So for those not familiar with Unity, the, the this is something that you set up in the editor and then you get a, a text object that you can update every frame uh, with the score. And this makes maybe some people in the, the room uh, scream uh, internally because this allocates, um, uh, this makes memory allocation to transform the int into a string every frame because, uh, because C-sharp. Uh, but you can fix it pretty easily. You just remember the last score in the last update. And if the score has changed since last update, you update the text. And here I see I forgot to update also the last score. Uh, of course, I should update the last score. So it's a bit more code, but it solves the uh, CG allocation problem. And some of you might also be screaming at me because internally, because I put a static um, globally accessible thing. Um, honestly, I think that's not that bad. I think uh, games are state machine by, uh, by definition and that centralizing all the state is really not that bad and actually pretty good. And if you think about it, uh, these solutions, uh, so let's say this, this one mostly, so use, uh, the solution is use an ECS. This, this actually means use global state because an ECS typically it's a word, or at least in a Unity uh, default uh, solution dots, it's a word that is accessible from all systems that you can, uh, you can get the information you need from the gameplay system, you can get the information you need from the UI systems. So it's basically a global, it's, uh, it's not uh, worse than, uh, than a singleton or not better than a singleton, it just has a fancy name and so uh, everybody gives, gives it a pass. But it's global data still. Uh, same for scriptable objects. So scriptable objects, depending on how, how you ar architect your, uh, your thing, of course, but the point is that you can access some piece of data from different um, places in your game, in your game code or uh, your game scene. So again, it's exposing some states to different pieces to work together. And in a way, dependency injection is the same uh, idea. You pass like the whole spiel of the, the dependency injection thing is that you don't have to use like singletons or global states because you pass everything to each object. You pass them dependencies, hence the dependency injection, and the different object will talk with each other through the dependencies. So in the end, it's still exposing some, some and sharing some states, maybe in a more controlled fashion uh, but my point, my final uh, point is really this, uh, like global state is not that bad, it's actually pretty good uh, and um, all those solutions are just fancy ways to share global state, in my opinion. There is more to it, but uh, I think they bring more complexity than uh, solutions. It's a, bit of, it's a bit a solution in search of a problem in this case, I think. Uh, all right, so that's... That was one way to get rid of the two string every frame, to get rid of the allocs. Uh, we also have another way, I think it's later in the slides. So let me first talk about 
lists of elements in a uh, in, uh, UI um, code. Because here, the example is pretty simple. I just have a score, and I update it uh, every frame, uh, very basic. But what if you have a list of elements? Uh, maybe uh, the cards in the game that you saw before at the bottom. And the game state contains a, a list of cards. And the, um, the idea is that the UI should not have to be called by the gameplay code that says like, oh, I just drew a card, so I just draw, drawn, drawn a card, so you have to add a game object to your, uh, to your hand uh, thing. Uh, no, it's the, 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 the UI of the cards will notice that a card has been added to the game, to the gameplay state. So imagine just here, uh, besides the score, imagine a list of projects. In our case, it's IDs of projects. Uh, and then we consume it like this. So we, we go um, on our mono behavior, we have a card template which is a mono behavior that is able to display a card. And then uh, a list of card templates, which I, I it should be called um, a card pool. It's uh, misnamed. And, or a card, yeah, card pool. And then in your update function, so this runs every frame, you just cycle through the list of cards that are currently in, in hand. Um, so here we get the project ID from that list of cards. This is in the game state, and and uh, you you request an instance of your uh, card template. So this little function, utility function, will uh, instantiate the card template and put it in the pool. So the the list here that we have on our class, and we give it an index as well. So next time it's called, it can just reuse the card that was in the pool at the same index. So it instantiates it only once. And then we call a uh, refresh on it, which is basically a per frame update, but called by us. So we don't have the overhead of Unity and we can control the uh, order of operations. And then after the loop, uh, it's important not to forget to disable any um, card views that might be in the pool, but not be in the game state anymore. Because maybe I play the card, so now the game state list has one card less, and so uh, we should disable the last card of the in the pool. Uh, and this utility method uh, does it as well. It takes the count of the actual counts of the cards and disables the the last one if uh, we if we assume that uh, there was one card that was played. And this worked uh, really well for us uh, in Terraformers. Like it, it saved us, I think, from the from from more complexity and having to like tr um, trigger events and uh, having like more complicated uh, systems for uh, propagation of changes. Uh, checking, like polling every frame. Checking it might sound a bit brute forcey or a bit uh, yeah, a bit brutal. But actually, it's really not bad at all. Like for performance, it we really didn't uh, suffer from that at all, um, because typically, like just setting um, setting some text to the same text as before, or just uh, enabling a game object that was already enabled, because yes, the 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 util thing like uh, enables a game object as needed and disables them as needed. If if a game object was already enabled the uh, frame before, it will not cost anything. So it's almost instant, honestly. Uh, maybe if you have thousands of entities that you update, it uh, could be bad. But in a UI, uh, you anyway never have thousands of stuff because a human wouldn't be able to interact with it anyway. So it's pretty uh, human scale and pretty easy to manage. Um, all right, uh, I should maybe accelerate a little bit, a little bit. But here is the code from from the the pool, um, the pooling stuff. Uh, don't uh, mind this uh, this wiggly lines. Uh, it's uh, by design that it's done like this. But uh, if you want, you can uh, check it out on the the VOD uh, later if you are interested. And for avoiding uh, CG allocations, we have like some utils in uh, Terraformers, like number string no alloc, 
we just return the string <laughs> that was hard coded in a, an array, so we don't have to generate a string. Um, it sounds super dumb, like it looks, it looks super dumb, but it works. Like it doesn't generate garbage. We just return the number at the correct index, and we are done with it. And we generate this big array with uh, some code that we just run once, and, and we're good. We have another trick, which is um, this function get text formatted. I don't know why we called it exactly like that, but it takes a localiz localization key. Uh, so that's kind of besides the points, but it uh, basically will get the format string that you can use to insert arguments in a string, like, like you do in uh, C sharp uh, when you format strings. Um, but it's designed to be uh, called every frame. And if you call those functions every frame with the same input, we use the cached version of the string. So you can see here, we have a hash that we initialize and we hash all the arguments that, uh, that we pass. So typically strings or ints, uh, basically string or ints. Uh, it can be uh, other type of, uh, of uh, data on the stack also. Um, but yeah, uh, we generate the string we, we, we run this function cache formatted string with the data once, and then uh, it's, uh, it's cached, and we can just retrieve it here from the hash uh, and never generate it uh, once again. And it works pretty well, so it was, uh, if you want to try it in your projects, feel free to, to steal that code. Um, now, um, okay, so this is uh, the, the next section of the talk, so uh, I'm done with Terraformers. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, immediate mode GUIs. Uh, who knows what uh, immediate mode uh, GUI is? Pretty much most people. Okay, okay, good to know. Okay, so I will try to go fast. Uh, I have only uh, four minutes left, three minutes? Time flies, okay. I hope I didn't bore you too much with the Unity uh, thing. Uh, okay, so immediate mode GUIs gu gu are a way uh, of um, programming GUIs. Uh, each time you draw a frame, you call functions like uh, draw text, draw rectangle, draw button, draw uh, whatever you want uh, as a widget, draw image, and uh, they immediately draw something on the screen or in the buffer, uh, vertex buffer or whatever. And uh, so each frame you redraw everything, which sounds also kind of wasteful, but actually no, it's, uh, it's very performant really good, and it completely bypasses the problem of synchronizing game state and UI state. Uh, so that's what I found really beautiful about uh, uh, immediate mode uh, GUIs, is that uh, you just draw the thing. So if you want to draw the score, you draw uh, game state dot score, let's say, and you draw it at some place in the on the screen, and uh, you don't have to remember to update the the text element when the the, um, the score changes or whatever uh, it's it's all automatic same for collection of objects you just put it them in the loop and you draw draw them in a loop and uh, no synchronization needed needed um the blop and uh, immediate mode GUIs are the actually the way that Unity draws its own editor windows at least uh, like most of them they switch to a new uh, system uh, officially, but uh, actually, if you look behind, it's still the old thing, mostly. Um <coughs> a popular C++ library uh, exists. It's called Gear MGUI. It's uh, really, really good. And complex UIs are totally possible in uh, immediate mode uh, GUIs and in-game UIs as well. So that's something that mostly people say it's for debugging purposes and stuff. Actually, it can also be used in in-game, uh, no problem. Um, this is a talk explaining exactly what uh, immediate mode uh, graphic uh, user interfaces are, but actually you know already, so no need. Uh, just if you want to, to check it uh, one more time, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty good. And this is just a screenshot of uh, in GUI in, uh, in use. And quick comparison of the amount of code needed to show the score as a text mm -hmm. and uh, run, uh, an image, like a character portrait of it. Um, and also at the bottom, so three UI, UI elements. You can see that in the immediate mode case, 
you have mostly three lines of code with the effect of the button uh, additionally. But in the written mode uh, GUI, so more traditional, like the system in uni Unity uh, for, uh, for gameplay, uh, you have to create the, the widgets first or get a, a reference to them or initialize them in some ways. The button needs to have a callback uh, um, registered, etc. And then you need to update them as game state changes. So as we did in Terraformers, it's every frame, every frame we update them. And, um, and here is the callback. So it's a little bit more code and you have to, if you have collection of items, for example, it gets trickier because you have to add them, remove them. You can see uh, the, the pool uh, thing I explained is stuff that you have to bother uh, doing that you don't have to in, uh, in GUIs. So that's really why I, I love them, the im, im GUIs. Uh, I will skip that slide because I don't have time's up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, drawing cut primitive, so that's not that useful. But uh, yeah, if you want to do your own uh, imgui, you need a, a draw rectangle function, a draw text function, and if you use a library like SDL or a Raylib, uh, there are those exact function functions uh, available. If not, you can still use vertex buffer, index buffer, and draw command buffer, as I call them, to to make a list of stuff to render and to store vertex and triangles to render at the end of the frame. And that's what I did in my engine. Uh, so I don't know about the time if I should stop soon, but uh, if you are interested. But uh, this, is the, this is basically the setup um, in my engine, and this is coding a, a ingui button from scratch, from start to finish. So here I just draw a rectangle. I hope you can read the code, but uh, First line is making a rectangle, and third line now is uh, drawing the rectangle on screen. And you can see it shows up at, at the right side. So it's uh, I um, I have hot reloading of code in my uh, engine. So when I modify the code, it automatically compiles and reloads on the right side. And um, so here I'm just changing the color to be grayscale. Ooh, uh, I think we cannot see that on the screen, right? Normal. <laughs> oh, okay, shit. Okay, so the calibration is different uh, on the screen. Ah, that will make it very, very bad. Uh, yeah, now you can see the text on the button, but not the box. So that's a bit sad. Ah, that sucks. But anyway, I'm out of time, so I should maybe uh, speed it up. The idea is that uh, this code is what is needed to draw a button uh, from start to finish with a hover effect, uh, mouse down effect, uh, triggering only when the button was clicked on the button and released on the button, not click outside and released on top. Uh, so it's, it has all the functionality that you would expect, expect from a button, except maybe animations or stuff. And you can extract it in a function, like so. So the function is at the top. And now, oh shit, and now I, I'm only, all right, I'm only calling the function to, to draw uh, multiple buttons. And I will skip that, I need to, to move on. But layouting, uh, this is a technique for layouting that I find pretty appealing. Uh, you get, you get a, a root rec rectangle uh, that you define in code, and then you, you can use the cut left a function to cut it in smaller chunks like this and draw your stuff in a s this could be for a toolbar let's say so rect cut method is, uh, is great there is an article about it you can look it up um, and this is a more complex um, example where you just chip away at a, at, a, um, at a layout rectangle I don't really have time to explain fully I hope you get the idea uh, this is a, an example of a scroll view, which again, I don't really have time to explain, <laughs> but uh, it's, it was also made uh, from scratch with this foundation. Um, and last thing I will show is the, the so yeah, this we don't care. So we need, we need a UI builder because we, we are not going to make everything from 100% with code for a bigger game. So we need a, a visual editor that programmers and artists can use. And this doesn't mean we have to, to switch to written mode uh, either fully. 
uh, we can build it on top of the of the imgui uh, system um, at least that's what i'm uh, currently trying so let's skip so it's all the <laughs> all the things i want to to achieve but uh, no time but this is a proof of concept uh, you have a list of nodes so this is very retained mode like it's uh, it's uh, authored content here. You can uh, add the child nodes, etc., and then you can change their properties on the right uh, with the inspector. And um, so you can do auto layouting, stuff like this. But every node is ba basically only um, calling the imgui uh, functions, like I don't know, scroll view or um, or um, uh, tinting or uh, scaling or uh, all the effects that you could. Uh, uh, expect so it's kind of uh, as a layer on top of the imgui and here you can see a slider that was fully coded it's it, it doesn't have uh, elements for all its parts and and yeah gonna stop here but uh, it's a work in progress um, and I think the, the goal is to keep the usability of uh, imgui um, which is uh, not having to synchronize the data that I really want to keep even in that model and uh, to be continued. Uh, hopefully I, I manage to do it and I can share it with you uh, next time, who knows. And that's it for the talk.